Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Gavin Yamey. I'm a professor of global health here at DGHI, professor of public policy over at Sanford, and I lead a center called the Center for Policy Impact in Global Health, a center that is very interested in universal health coverage. And so today is a very relevant, very exciting um, day for us. I've been waiting for this panel. Well, it's not a panel, it's a fireside chat for a very long time. <laughs> Settle in by the Yule Logs. Make yourself comfortable. You're all welcome. Welcome to those who are joining by webcast from around the world. Today's fireside chat is on Alma Arta at 40 years. What is this milestone and what does it mean for global health and human rights? 40 years ago, practically to this day, the world of global health came together in the former USSR in Alma Arta, a town that's now called Almaty, for the International Conference on Primary Health Care. The most famous thing that came out of the conference, of course, is the Alma Arta Declaration. Ben Mayer, who I'll introduce shortly, just passed me a copy of the original declaration. This is priceless. You have a cheap internet printout um, uh, by your desk. Um, and the most sort of um, memorable, I think, aspect of the declaration, and there are several, but the one that has probably had the most kind of salience and resonance was the call for health for all by the year 2000. The geopolitics then were rather different. Ben Mayer owns this photo. This photo from the Alma Arta conference is of Hufton Mahler, who was the Director General of the WHO, sitting next to Ted Kennedy, the US representative, who was six months away, I believe, from running for uh, President of the United States, but was there in the USSR for that conference that mattered so much to him and to all of us. Well, I was only 10 at the time, so I'm not sure I even knew what was going on. And I've given away my age. Um, health for all came and went by the year 2000. It was a fantasy. It was just a mirage, right? So if it was a fantasy and a mirage that came and went, why on earth are we having a fireside chat today, 40 years later? Why on earth is the global health community convening on Almaty this week? What was it about that declaration that still matters today? It's actually very short. I encourage you to read it. The language, the vision is incredibly powerful and beautiful. And there's much to love about it. Your other handout, a little bit of a plug, <coughs> is that the Lancet Commission on Investing in Health that published its Global Health 2035 report five years ago has just done an update, published in time for the Almaty meeting, where we revisit the vision of global health transformation through the lens of Alma Arta and UHC. And the last plug is this week the BMJ, the British Medical Journal, is launching a new series timed for Alma Arta on the links between health, well-being, wealth and profits. <coughs> Myself and Debbie Sridhar at the University of Edinburgh um, are guest editing. Plenty for us to think about, plenty for us to digest, and I cannot think of three Fine, finer scholars um, than the ones we have today to help us think through the issues, the debates, the touch points. Joy Noel Baumgartner will chair the Fireside Chat. She is research faculty here in DGHI. She's the director of the DGHI Evidence Lab, which conducts rigorous evaluation, evaluation research in low resource settings with local partners to inform evidence-based programs and interventions. Her master's in social work was from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. She has a PhD in maternal and child health from UNC Chapel Hill and a postdoctoral fellowship in psychiatric epidemiology from Columbia. Before joining DJHI, she was at FHI 360 as a scientist for 10 years. To her right, our deputy director at the center Osondu Obwoji, um, who is also a research scholar here at DGHI. His main research interest is in making health systems work better for the poor. His medical training was at the University of Ibadan in Nigeria. His MPH was from Hopkins, and his doctorate in global health was from Harvard University. He has held a large number of public health positions in Nigeria previously, including with Doctors Without Borders and Management Sciences for Health. To Joy Noel's, oh, welcome. Left is Benjamin Mason 
Maya, I've been practicing, I keep saying Maya, but it's Maya, is associate. <laughs> it's the other way around! Oh! <laughs> I was in the mirror this morning, <laughs> getting it right. Ben is Associate Professor of Global Health Policy and the Zachary Taylor Smith. Distinguished Professor of Public Policy in the Department of Public Policy at UNC Chapel Hill. If we have time in the Q&A, we'll find out from him who Zachary Taylor Smith is or was. His interdisciplinary research examines human rights frameworks for global health governance. He's examined the development, evolution and implementation of human rights, has consulted for governments, NGOs and international institutions. And his most recent book... Available on Amazon, I'm sure, and at all good book sh bookshops worldwide, which he co-edited with Larry Gostin, which the two of them presented earlier uh, this year at Duke, along with Alicia Yamin. Um, it's called Human Rights in Global Health, Rights-Based Governance for a Globalizing World. Let's welcome Joy Noel Sondu and ben. Thank you, Gavin. We appreciate the introductions. Always enthusiastic. Um, um, so I just want to orient folks a little bit on um, the Alma Alta Declaration before we dive deep into the panel discussion. Um, some of you have copies in front of you. You may or may not have read them, but I just want to actually check in a little bit on some of the highlights so that we're all on the same page. And um, a big part of the panel today is having questions from you all. So. As Gavin already highlighted, um, the declaration was adopted at the International Conference on Primary Health Care in 1978. Um, and it emerged as a major milestone of the 20th century in the field of public health as it um, identified primary health care as the key to the attainment of the goal of health for all. The conference called for urgent and effective national and international action to develop and implement primary health care throughout the world and particularly in developing countries in a spirit of technical cooperation. <coughs> it urged governments, the WHO and UNICEF, as well as other international organizations, multilaterals, bilateral agencies, NGOs, funding agencies, health workers, and the um, larger community, the larger global health community, to support this commitment to primary health care um, and channel increased technical and financial support to it. Some of our panelists today might talk about how it was, um, the declaration was perhaps rapidly eclipsed by a movement toward a very select group of vertical interventions, um, largely focused on maternal and child health, and we can speak a little bit about that um, influence, um, and then what we're doing 40 years later. But I wanted to highlight, if you haven't read it, every word of it is worth taking a look at. Um, because it really sets the, the, the framework for highlighting global health, our health as a human right, um, reaching for the attainment of the highest possible level of health, um, that it's um, unacceptable to have inequalities globally. Um, and I actually like, I actually think some of the wording in here is radical and we don't hear it anymore about um, contributing to better quality of life and to world peace. How often do we have world peace actually mentioned? Um, in many of our declarations um, anymore or any of our calls to action. Um, it defines primary health care as essential health care based on practical, scientifically sound, and socially acceptable methods and technology made universally accessible um, to individuals and families um, through their full participation and at a cost, and we're going to be talking about the cost aspects, that the community and the country can afford at every stage of their development in a spirit of self-reliance and self-determination. And some of those words we actually are hearing even more um, in terms of our current administration in the U.S. Um, I also wanted to highlight that it's got um, uh, an interesting caveat in here. If you read to the very end, and I don't think that this is negligible, it's certainly not necessarily highlighted in um, the, the current drafts of the Declaration, but it states that an acceptable level of health for all people of the world by the year 2000 can be attained through a fuller and better use of the world's resources, a considerable part of which is now spent on armaments and military conflicts. Again, I think some of this language, it was radical then. Um, it's still radical now if we wanted to include it. Um, but I'm going to open it up with some questions for our panelists. <coughs> Starting with Ben. Uh, you ready? You're ready. Okay. <laughs> How has the Declaration of Alma-Ata framed the health and human rights movement? So, 
I'm delighted to frame, and I think we're going to advance to the next slide. Oh, uh, yes. For this. Um, it's, it's wonderful to be here playing an away game here at Duke. Oh, it's just one slide. There you go. You're good. You're totally good. Um, wonderful to be here playing an away game from UNC. I'm Benjamin Mason Meyer. Um, coming here from across the back of. It, it's wonderful to join Gavin. And uh, Joy and Asandu, um, to be a part of a really inspiring conversation that began 40 years ago and continues to have resonance today. So in thinking about how health and human rights have been shaped by, shaped by the Declaration of Alma Atta, I want to begin earlier than the Declaration of Alma Atta and I want to end at the present day, really focusing on this 70-year history since the end of the Second World War. I want to begin by talking about human rights under international law as a basis for public health. And this is really, in many ways, where the health and human rights movement lies. This idea that human rights under international law can shape public health was a new idea given birth through the United Nations. With the UN Charter establishing human rights as one of the four principal purposes of that United Nations. And as Joy reads through some of the Declaration of Alma Atta, Keep in mind that as we talk about these documents, it's not only that every word matters, but that every word was fought over politically. And so when we talk about legal language for a human right to health, what we're trying to say is this is a politically constructed document that seeks to reflect obligations that nations have placed upon themselves. And so in the aftermath of the war, we see a right to health declared for the first time in the 1946 Constitution of the World Health Organization. Never before had nations come to together and said that health is a fundamental human right. Defining health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. And placing obligations on governments, not simply for medical interventions, but for social systems that are necessary to realize this standard of health. From there, the nations would come together <coughs> to craft a universal declaration of human rights in 1948. We see Eleanor Roosevelt, the chief US negotiator and the chairperson of the committee, developing that universal declaration here on the slide. Recognizing that human rights standard as a common standard for all peoples and all nations, it would lay out not a right to health, but a right to a standard of living adequate for health, specifically including both medical care and a wider range of underlying determinants of health, food, clothing, housing, shelter. In the aftermath of this, however, we see a downward dip. The politics of the Cold War intervene. <coughs> a right to health becomes a basis for Soviet criticism of inequalities in healthcare in the United States. And the United States responds by pushing back against any mention of human rights in the context of health. The Declaration of Alma Atta here <coughs> lies at a turning point a turning point where human rights are seen as relevant, as a normative framework, and as a political catalyst for advancing primary health care. The World Health Organization under its Health for All movement in the 1970s would think of this rights-based approach as a revolution, a revolution in approaching health care as necessary as a human right. <coughs> and implicating a far wider range of underlying determinants of health. You have in your hands the Declaration, but the document the WHO produced was significantly longer, hundreds of pages seeking to describe programmatically what primary health care included, and laying those out as human rights obligations. At the Declaration, and in Alma Atta, we begin to see countries coming together around a shared vision, a vision that is necessary for peace, a vision that is necessary for economic development, <coughs> and a way to restructure the entire planet to reinforce a new international economic order. As countries in the global south unshackled themselves from the bonds of colonization, took their place among the nations in the World Health Assembly, they sought to redefine what it meant to talk about health in the world, to create a new international health order that would succeed where previous declarations had failed. The Declaration of Alma Atta 
while laying out primary health care as a human <coughs> right, revitalizing the standards first laid out in the Constitution of the World Health Organization, would nevertheless fail itself in the 1980s with a shift toward neoliberalism, a pushback against human rights, a focus on the marketization of health as the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund stepped into a vacuum of leadership in the World Health Organization, a vacuum of leadership that was created at the hands of Western countries that recognized that if the Alma-Ata Declaration's vision of health for all became a reality, that international obligations would be set up to realize the highest attainable standard of health for peoples throughout the world. Health for all became seen as a threat to markets, as a threat to capitalism. And so in the final year of the Cold War, we see a pushback against that vision with primary health care narrowed to what would become known as selective primary health care. And yet human rights would endure in global health, seen most forcefully in the rights-based response to an expanding HIV AIDS pandemic, with civil society holding out rights to be free from discrimination, to be free from stigma, to be free as human beings at the center of a global health response. From civil society to the World Health Organization, we would begin to see a rights-based approach to global governance. At the end of the Cold War and at the beginning of the 21st century, the UN takes up this right to health. And in its 14th general comment on the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, it seeks to establish a right to health that includes many of the things that had been lost since the Declaration of Alma-Ata. Recognizing not only medical care is relevant to health, but a right to health that includes a wide range of underlying determinants of health social, economic, and political determinants, and recognizing that many determinants of health are outside of the control of the government, recognizing the importance of global <laughs> obligations among all nations for all peoples in order to assure the highest attainable standard of health. In the 21st century, and based upon General Comment 14, we see the World Health Organization re-engaging with human rights anew as a foundation for universal health coverage. Dr. Tedros having won an election, the first open election for Director General of the World Health Organization, established the right to health as a normative foundation for his focus on universal health coverage. And I was honored to interview him during the campaign to talk about what that human rights foundation means. Since becoming Director General, Dr. Tedros has put human rights at the center of universal health coverage and sought to use a human rights foundation to establish universal health coverage as the next primary health care. And that's the debate that's taking place this week in Astana. Just a short drive from Alma-Ata, two conferences in Kazakhstan, 40 years apart, thinking about the extent to which a right to health can be a foundation for global health governance. It all begins in Kazakhstan, and it all gets celebrated this week in Kazakhstan again. So. It's a pleasure to be a part of the conversation, and I hope that um, we can have a robust dialogue about what this means for global health and human rights. Thank you for laying it out that way. I really appreciate that. Um, and you'll have to walk us through. I can't see from here. What is the last photo of? Oh, that's a photo of my book. Thank you for asking. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's called Human Rights and Global Health, Rights-Based Governance for a Globalizing World. There you go. Systematically examines human rights across 20 different international organizations. And you'd almost think that was planned. But that <laughs> I actually couldn't see, but that is perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks for falling into that. <laughs> All right, Asunde, let's turn to you. Um, why are we still talking about this 40 years later, this declaration? Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks. I think uh, it's important to. First of all, celebrate the successes that, has, that um, have happened. It's been 40 years and still it's important. I don't think the whole world will um, converge on um, Alma Ati um, Alma to discuss this if it wasn't um, if they didn't consider it important. 
Um, I have a few slides I'd like to share. Uh, first, um, shows a picture of the world the way it was in 1977. These, um, the, the colors here show the life expectancy at birth, which is uh, how long someone, a baby who is born in that year is expected to live. And we see that most of the world is, well, most of Sub-Saharan Africa and um, Southeast Asia is orange and yellow, which is about 50, 60, 70. And none of the world is in the purple band, which is about 85. But this is what we have today. The world has actually shown significant improvement. Um, life expectancy is so high in um, most of the advanced nations of the world, but it's still a little bit low in Sub-Saharan Africa. And also, in many ways, we have <coughs> seen progress. There's been progress. And this is despite all the challenges that the countries have faced. In the 90s, there was the economic recession in Sub-Saharan Africa. Latin America also experienced its own um, share of um, economic woes. And during all this period, there were dips in life expectancy in those regions, but they still caught up. Some will argue that this is not really as a result of water <coughs> or primary health care, but ma mainly as a result of the Millennium Development Goals, um, because a lot of the progress was done, was um, achieved between 2000 and 2015. But yet, Alma Atu was important because it was one of the first global movements that made the world converge on, like Ben described, an ideal that had a human rights focus to decide that health was important and health was necessary for well-being. Um, Joy Noel already mentioned that there, were, there are several points, and you have them in front of you, several points in that declaration, even though most people talk about the primary health care part, but there were several ideals that were there. And so the world moved for the first time towards a unified ideal goal. And the reason why we talk about primary health care in most of the world today started because of the primary health care movement in Alma Ata. Uh, ben highlighted some of the challenges that uh, were faced. And um, I'll talk a little bit about that. But before then, this, this is from a paper we just um, published. And it just shows the world again and shows the <coughs> life expectancy compared with the gross national income per capita. So how much does a country, um, can a country afford to spend per individual and the life expectancy? And we can see here that, uh, I'm sorry if it's not clear, but we can see here that uh, the US um, gross national income per capita in 2016 US dollars is about 41,000. Sub-Saharan Africa and India have the lowest of 1,600. And so we can see here that even though from the previous slides that change has not been uniform, we can see here that countries that can afford to spend less on health tend to do worse um, on life expectancy. But it's not so much about how much you can afford to spend, but also what you buy with what you have. Because you can see for India, India and Sub-Saharan Africa have an average gross national income per capita of 1,600, but still you see that a child that is born in India on average is expected to live nine years longer than a child born in Sub-Saharan Africa. So there are some other factors that come into <coughs> play um, beyond just financing. Yet, we will say that even though there's been progress, the essential goal of achieving healthcare for all by the year 2000 was not achieved. And I think the whole world agrees on that. And several reasons have been attributed to the failure of the world to achieve that. One of them is the selective primary health care movement, which immediately came up after the primary health care declaration. And really that was as a result of the vagueness that um, was um, inherent in the declaration. And no one really knew what primary health care was going to, the package of services that would um, until primary health care. But, and then there was this movement, and I think we will discuss that, and it will be nice to have a robust discussion about that. Another reason was the fact that anything that you want to do has to be paid for. And um, when you have, when countries leave the Kumbaya um, meetings where everyone is happy and we seek an ideal world and they go back to their government, some hard choices have to be made. And when those hard choices are being made, uh, you have to decide to spend on things 
and decide not to spend on others. And those are inherently political decisions. There is no way, uh, there's no recipe you can propose for that. And uh, in the declaration, you see things about spending less on uh, uh, military <coughs> conflict and all that, and more on, um, on health care. But those are decisions that will be made at the country level. Uh, so we see all that. The third point I'd like to uh, make here is that the world is different today than it was 40 years ago. And so we're talking about this today because we cannot adopt the solutions that we um, adopted 40 years ago for today. If we were to design a healthcare system from ground up, most time, uh, we will not design what we have in most countries today. And so we need to have this discussion about what does it mean that the universal health care, um, universal health coverage movement will now be the primary health care of the future. How will we pay for this? What, send, well, what, what packages of services will be included? And we can see from this here that the blue shade is non-communicable um, non diseases. The group one diseases, which is the, um, the one on the top, includes communicable diseases, maternal and child health um, diseases, and then you have injuries. In 1990, we don't have numbers for 1978, so the, 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 the earliest we have is from 1990. You see that non-communicable diseases accounted for less than 50% of the disease burden in the world if you measure by DALIs. But today, as of last year, um, sorry, as of 2016, we see that non-communicable diseases account for close to two thirds. Um, for those of you who like details, you can see here um, a breakdown. And if you've been in public health for a while, you'll probably think that HIV, AIDS, and TB is like the biggest <coughs> problem the world faces, but it's not if you measure by dialysis. It's also not if you measure by mortality. It's really important um, <coughs> as a disease, and I'm not trying to say um, it should not be focused on, but when you look at the big picture, it's just one of so many problems that we face. And if we're to address these problems today, we need to think very carefully about what that means for the services that we we'll provide and how we're going to move forward with that. Finally, right now the world spends about $9.6 trillion per year on health. And the latest um, estimate that just came out says that if we are, as a world, uh, um, as a world together, going to achieve the, um, the health-related sustainable development goals by 2030, we will need to spend an additional 371 billion per year on top of the 9.6 trillion that we spend in order to achieve that. Um, some of it is going to come from economic growth, but even after the projections to 2030 for economic growth, we still have a gap, financing gap of close to 50 billion per year. And those when you cannot pay for everything, even in our own small homes and personal finances, we have to make some choices. And I think that's where that will be the next phase and the discussions that we will have once everyone comes out from the seminar that is happening um, today. And probably we might have some of that today too. Yeah. Thank Thank you. Thank you. No, I appreciate um, the economic aspects of um, paying for and understanding um, how we have to respond to both the economics and the changing burden of disease. So that was a, a great overview. So Ben, I have a follow-up question for you. Um, how does the upcoming, this week, Astana Declaration recommit to the human rights principles of the Declaration of Alma-Alti, if it does? Um, and how is human rights framing universal health coverage today? So. So I think recognizing the role of human rights in universal health coverage and now in framing the Astana Declaration picks up on some of the points that Asandu raised. We have a world of different interventions and a limited amount of money. What interventions do we prioritize? And then secondly, how do we measure the impact of those? Do we spend on surgery? Do we spend on prevention? Do we measure in terms of disability-adjusted life years, or mortality, or do we care about specific populations more than others? These are the types of conversations that take place among those of us who work in human rights, trying to recognize the ways in which human rights can help to frame these debates. Coming out of the general comment 14 that I discussed earlier, the UN sought to disaggregate 
the attributes of the right to health, to focus on the ways in which health interventions for both medical care and underlying determinants of health can be seen as available, accessible, acceptable, and of sufficient quality. Are they available in sufficient amounts? Are they accessible, physically accessible, and economically accessible? Are they acceptable culturally in terms of gender, in terms of nationality? And are they of sufficient quality scientifically and in terms of outcomes? So as we recognize these attributes and try to realize those attributes in ways that are done in non-discriminatory interventions with participation of communities and with mechanisms for accountability. This is the language that we begin to see in the Astana draft. The zero draft was, from my perspective, um, a step backwards from the Declaration of alma Ata. It didn't recognize these attributes of non-discrimination and equality. It didn't focus as heavily as the Declaration of alma Ata did on participation and accountability. It lost track of this bold definition of the right to health that was first expressed in the Declaration of Alma Ata. As the drafts have evolved, we begin to see progress. We begin to see these attributes laid out specifically in the Declaration of Alma Ata, moving beyond, sorry, what did I say, in the Declaration of Astana. So in the Declaration of Astana, we begin to see progress from the Declaration of Alma Ata. We begin to see a focus on these attributes that are laid out in General Comment 14. We begin to see a focus on non-discrimination and equality, and yet there are still gaps that remain. And one of the gaps that I want to highlight is not just what human rights is, but what human rights isn't. The Astana Declaration focuses in its seventh paragraph on a need to respect both human rights and national sovereignty. National sovereignty is anathema to human rights. If human rights says that all people throughout the world should have certain basic entitlements, then the idea of national sovereignty, that what happens within a nation's border is no one's business but that nation's, those two ideas become impossible to relate to one another. In some ways, this is a reflection of the conservative populist world we live in now, that nations no longer want to be scrutinized on their human rights performance. We begin to see a drift away from human rights, with nations violating human rights, in some cases openly, and in some cases through neglect of the health of populations. More than that, we begin to see nations shifting away from global governance, becoming more isolationist in international affairs. This idea of national sovereignty ties those ideas together. The idea of human rights violations without accountability, and the idea of isolationism together. If human rights is to survive, human rights need to belong to all peoples everywhere. To declare, as the Declaration of Alma Ata did, that it is a universal standard for all people and all nations. I'm concerned that the, the declarations that will come out of Astana while they will repeat many of the same declarations from Alma Ata, they will neglect to focus on this key question of sovereignty. And so as the Astana Declaration is finalized today, I think that is the key phrase that you need to look at. It's a politically fraught phrase. It is a phrase that people are fighting for and against in these debates. And it is the key to understanding the future of human rights in this increasingly uncertain world. So just to clarify for our audience, from the human rights principles, do you think that the <clears throat> al Malta Declaration is stronger and bolder than the current version of the Astana Declaration as it is this week? I would say that the original draft, the Astana Declaration has been debated now for about a year, leading up to today's finalization of it. The original draft was particularly weak and, I would say, a step backwards from Alma Ata. It has improved, and some of us in academia have been working on this, people in civil society have been working on this, governments have taken a stand to introduce human rights language where there was none at the beginning. 
to focus on participation and non-discrimination, to bring out attributes of the right to health and to lay out a right to health foundation for the discussions in Astana. There are still weaknesses, however, and I think that national sovereignty is, is one of the principal weaknesses and one of the principal concerns in these final hours of debate. Well, that's not encouraging. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm glad that people like you have been working for the last year to get it better than it was, and that you've seen the versions of the draft and can explain that history to us. But it's, um, you would think that as we go forward, things would get bolder and stronger and more visionary and not um, more tempered, I guess. Um, I think the lesson that comes out of both Astana and the Declaration of Almada before it is that when nations start to think about the implications of these declarations for their own economic commitments, for their own um, governance and beliefs, then states start to be the ones that push back on this more than anything else. Yeah. That civil society has always pushed for strong international commitments. Um, disagreements on what those norms should be, on what types of things we should prioritize. One of the debates that comes out of Almata and is still unresolved in Astana, um, and Astana can speak to a little bit better, is this focus on either vertical interventions or horizontal health systems. And Almata was supposed to usher in a focus on underlying determinants of health through horizontal primary health care systems. And in the 18 years into the 21st century, health for all by the year 2000 still has not been met because we continue to prioritize um, vertical interventions for select diseases through largely medical solutions. And well, thank you for helping me with that transition. Um, and I have to say, I am totally on the fence about some of the pros and cons related to selective versus more um, universal primary health care. As somebody who works in maternal and child health and mental health, maternal and child health has been core from the very beginning and has definitely gotten more attention in terms of resources and support. And yet mental health is still considered a luxury um, service and um, an upward battle to get included in primary health care. So anyway, so Asundu, let me follow up more specifically with you. How do you think the upcoming Astana Declaration will influence the programmatic implementation of universal health um, coverage <coughs> and how we monitor the indicators in the SGDs? Okay. Um, I'll first say I haven't seen the, um, new, the, the new one. Um, if... Uh, Based on Ben's comments, um, I saw an early draft. Um, when the new one comes out, we'll see what finally makes it into that. But I think that if the push is to move the new primary health care to be universal health coverage, then it will be good for us to learn a few lessons from, uh, from the past. Ben talked um, quite a bit on the, the policies and bringing everyone together under the human rights thing. I think one, of the, one other thing that will be important to think about is how to hold governments and countries accountable um, when they decide to veer off. I don't know that there is a way to do that right now, uh, but I think if it's going to be moved through the, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals and the UHC target in the Sustainable Development Goals, then maybe moving through the UN uh, the system to hold government accountable will be great. However, I'm also on the fence when it comes to selective versus primary health care because I feel like there's a place for each. Uh, I t tend to feel like primary health care as a platform can deliver a lot of um, services that are affordable, accessible, and acceptable at the point of care. I also feel like sometimes you need to have a vertical intervention to deal with some uh, diseases that, if not checked, will continue to um, um, balloon out of proportion. And we see that with HIV AIDS, we see that with malaria, um, we see that with polio that is about um, being eradicated. We also saw that with smallpox. So there's, I, I feel like there's a place um, for some of this. But I don't feel like most of the, um, the budget or the focus should be towards vertical interventions. I feel like if people have opportunities um, to have access to decent, uh, reliable, evidence-based care that is affordable for them, then that will be um, um, one way to achieve health care. Uh, the DCP3, the DCP is um, an acronym for the Disease Control Priorities Project. 
at least um, about 218 different interventions, not as a prescription for countries, but uh, as a way to help countries think through a package of services that they might um, offer to, to, as part of the primary health care system. Because primary health care, when it was originally defined, did not have this package of intervention. Then we now had the selective primary health care group that came out and said, it is not possible to provide health care for everyone because you don't know what healthcare means, right? What's in that package of services? And then they defined a basic package of services. I think it started with GoBee, then it expanded to GoBeef, and then GoBeef FFF, and the growth monitoring, breastfeeding, and all that. Um, you could go check out the details, but, and, and it was a very big debate for a long time. And people moved into different camps, which I think is a mistake. Uh, because once you move into different camps, then you start talking over each other and you don't find common ground and solve the problem. The problem really is people were getting married to the process and not to the goal. The goal was health for all by the year 2000, but because people, um, different groups disagreed on how to achieve that health for all, we still have those camps today. Some people are saying that we should scrap everything and bring everything, um, all the budget under one umbrella, and that we push towards primary health care. Mm -hmm. While others say you cannot, I mean, the people who are receiving money for HIV AIDS or vaccines today are not just going to sit idly by and allow all the monies to leave. So I think there's a happy medium in between, and I think the lessons, <coughs> in my opinion, the lesson, the one of the biggest lessons that we can learn from how the selective primary health care versus the, um, the primary health care mm -hmm. movement interacted is that we need to talk to each other. Uh, we need to not split into different camps and start struggling for the same pie of money because as it's clear, the money is not enough to go around for health. And if there's not enough money to go around, mm -hmm. then some sacrifices have to be made. But it's important that we really think about that. And one, one last point, I think even when we're talking about the economics of healthcare provision, it's important for us to also understand that the fact that we do not have enough money at any given time to spend for all the healthcare that we think we need, it doesn't mean that the ideal must be lowered, that health for all is an ideal that we should protect and we should continue to aspire towards. We will be working based on the constraints that we experience in real life, but I don't think we should lower the standards of the ideal that we set for ourselves. Thank you. Um, so you mentioned Go BFF, and for those that, that don't know, this was the, the early focus on selective um, services, and it included growth monitoring, oral rehydration, breastfeeding, immunization, family planning, and food fortification. So largely very maternal child health focused um, um, services. So I've got a ton more questions, but why don't we open up to the audience first um, and let you all ask some questions to our panelists. Melissa. Um, well, thank you, first of all, for a really incredible conversation. Um, I had not read the Declaration of Alma Ata before. I mean, this had always been, you know, of course, I knew of it and kind of always thought of it as this is sort of the declaration for for primary health care, but in reading it, it's really clear this is a declaration of health care as primary. And it's a, it's a sort of important, it's not so much about delivery of services as much as sort of elevating the importance of, of health. Um, and and I, so I enjoyed reading it in kind of the aspirational tone, and I think as you, as you pointed out, Joy Noel. Um, so I actually have two questions. Um, one is to then just to understand a little more about what it means to have a declaration and what it means to be, I mean, are, are, are countries signatories to that? Is there any type of accountability and monitoring? And, and what, does, what does that mean besides sort of saying, you know, this is what we believe? Um, and um, and then I assume it's signatories at a country level, but I, I would be interested to hear that. And the other one is to Sandu of just trying to trying to really can you kind of capture for us this move more between from primary healthcare to universal healthcare and in universal healthcare do we still talk about this language of primary healthcare or is it primary healthcare plus um, will the Astana Declaration be geared more to focusing on universal healthcare or using a language of universal healthcare versus primary healthcare. 
kind of wh where are we in that movement? I mean, whenever I hear universal health care, I think of health, universal health insurance coverage. Um, but I would just be curious to kind of understand that a little bit. Uh, happy to start. It's a little bit of a complicated answer that I will try to stay as succinctly as possible, which is the accountability for different declarations depends on which declaration it is. So human rights declarations tend to have treaty bodies that are attached to those declarations where countries will report periodically on their progress in meeting them. For the Declaration of Alma-Ata, this is something that's not ratified by individual countries, but ratified by the World Health Assembly of all nations. And so countries, when they report to WHO on the state of health, should use the Declaration of Alma-Ata as the framework by which they structure their health reporting. Now, one of the simplest things that I can say in thinking about human rights and global health is that ratification doesn't matter. That if you have ratified a treaty, that does not stop babies from dying. That does not stop women from dying in childbirth. That does not improve the water. It does not improve the air. It does nothing at all. And so we as academics have an important role to play in understanding not simply the development of international standards, but what comes the day after. What does that implementation process look like? And so it's important for those of us who work in the public policy space to ask the question, how do we transform international declarations into national policy, into local practice, into meaning in people's lives? And that, I think, has been a constant struggle since alma and will continue to be for the years to come. Yeah, so um, on the UHC, my sense is that we have the sustainable development goal that talks about moving towards universal health coverage. And the way it is defined currently does not limit it to what was traditionally defined as primary health care. Um, UHC talks about coverage and not care per se. And so this is access to um, probably most likely insurance because the discussions about what that will mean in terms of measuring is still going on. But I think. What's, what will hap mo most likely happen will be that because there is already a big movement towards universal health coverage, that primary health care will be put as part of that and so that it doesn't move the world in two different directions. Having said that, the primary health care component of what will eventually become universal health coverage will just be part of that. It's not going to be all because we still have other things like first level um, hospitals, tertiary care, and all the other things that we will not traditionally define as primary health care that will still have their place in health care because WHO right now is not only prioritizing health, it's also prioritizing um, financial risk protection and hoping that trying to help people not to fall into poverty as a result of health care expenditures. So looking at the other high ticket items for healthcare is also important in the universal health coverage. So I, I will see, I, uh, I feel like eventually primary healthcare um, movement will be, the primary healthcare component will be part of the universal health coverage um, big going forward, but I, it remains to be seen. Uh, discussions are still going on, yeah. So if you think uh, about the broader movement toward uh, universal health care, do you see WHO's role as greater or less than it was 40 years ago? And who are the other major players besides WHO? Either one of you. I can go. If you want to start. Um, I would hope that WHO will play a bigger role. Uh, and the reason is, if, if when WHO steps back and doesn't take the leadership in some um, health-related issues, then um, there's some confusion. And increasingly, we're seeing the World Bank uh, play significant roles in disease, disease control. Um, we're seeing other organizations playing significant roles, Gates Foundation, um, governments, but I, I feel, I, I think that the WHO should step up to play that role, and there is some evidence that that is beginning to happen with the new um, Director General trying to bring everything back on the WHO. The big concern with WHO is that they don't have a budget that can rival what the World Bank has or what maybe Gates Foundation has, and 
the way life happens is that if you cannot pay for many things and you have to go asking for other for money from others, then they tend to dictate how things happen. So uh, it's we don't know what will happen for WHO, but I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that WHO will be able to get that. And, and I would only add to that that this loss of WHO authority in the global health space and the proliferation of additional actors largely comes in the aftermath of Alma-Ata, where WHO is largely seen as impotent to deal with many global health issues, that it's constrained by political affairs and infighting among nations. As HIV be runs rampant throughout the world, the UN gives WHO a large vote of no confidence by establishing UN AIDS across the street. In 1989, as uh, a Convention on the Rights of the Child is being developed, it specifically focuses on primary health care for children drawing on the language of Alma-Ata, but giving UNICEF a far larger role in the global health space and becoming one of the leaders in the UN system. As Sandhu mentioned, the World Bank, which begins its global health funding in the early 1990s and really establishes itself as one of the funders now joined by the Global Fund. We see the Gates Foundation and a series of philanthropic <coughs> efforts now fighting with WHO for authority. As Dr. Tedros seeks to regain WHO's authority, it's not doing it through financial means. It does not have the money, but it's doing through, so through normative force and using human rights as a way of marshalling um, all of the organizations within the UN and outside of the UN to come together around a shared goal and that human rights can provide that, a framework for that shared goal. Yeah, uh, a hope and a question. Um, the hope is that if you go back to, to uh, 1978 and the 80s, there was a unifying force that that, uh, part, that uh, primary health care provided, and it got con it got made concrete through the eight elements, and you could walk down the halls in Geneva and see the the uh, the Almada poster, and you could walk go to a Puskas a little health facility in, in Indonesia, and see the same thing. So the hope is. The universal health coverage becomes that, uni that unified factor, partly because if you look across scores of countries that are high income, low income, mid income, income, the countries that have done the best with universal health care have founded it on a good, strong uh, private health care basis. You can't get, I won't say you can't, but very few people get to universal health coverage without a strong primary health system. The question is ideology versus evidence. If we look at the undoing of primary health care through the ideology of investing in the stuff first, you know, the agriculture, factories, roads, and that was, and, not, and then if you have enough at the end, you've invested in social services. That was the ideology. But what the bank evidence now shows is actually the evidence is the reverse. If you invest first in people, education, and health, you grow the economy. So the question is, I'm not a big deal, good job in marketing. Uh, and we haven't done a good job of marketing the Affordable Care Act here, because everybody likes the provisions, all of the provisions, nobody likes the, the uh, as many people don't like it. So the question is, can we use this evidence that investing first in education and health and get back <coughs> to the mindset, it's a win-win for countries, but they don't know it, because we haven't really got that message out there. So that's, that's really the question. Jonna, can you say who you are? Because it's amazing who you are. <laughs> You're speaking with incredible experience, and um, we'd love to hear about it. Well, just in brief, I, uh, John, real quick, I started in global health in uh, 1978, and uh, did an eight-country, four-continent tour from uh, Peru to Papua New Guinea, looking at essential medicines, um, and it worked for uh, the global health nonprofit. And, Spent 10 years at WHO with essential medicines, uh, using human rights to get uh, to, to help bring down the cost of AIDS medicines. So just a catch And I was a Duke Family Medicine resident, so I'm really happy to be happy living back in North Carolina. <laughs> I could say. Sure thing. <laughs> um, so there's actually been renewed interest in early childhood development programming and services delivered through um, primary care and health services platforms. And I think part of that is because they're able to try to make an argument for investing in children um, in terms of economic terms. So it resonates with the governments to see their future healthy workforce 
reaching their cognitive goals, reaching their social, emotional, developmental goals, and that sort of stuff. But you're right, it's about marketing and framing those health investments in different ways that are going to resonate with different stakeholders. So we now know that we don't just focus on Ministry of Health people because that's preaching to the choir. We need to be preaching to Ministry of Finance people and speaking in terminology and language that resonates with them so um, so they can make those decisions. And, um, and it's not just at the ministry level, but with the decentralization at the district health level when they make those budgets and, and how are they going to hear those investments. Um, and it's sort of a big, bigger picture, but I, I think all of that sounds really um, on point. So you wanted to add? And, and I would push back on this, and, and you see it from Alma-Ata all the way to Astana, which is largely <coughs> neglecting sexual and reproductive health and rights in really fundamental ways. That it's not simply a public relations failure, but it's an ideological conflict. That it's not that we aren't selling it well, it's that there are people who actively disagree with it. And in the aftermath of Alma-Ata, there was a huge pushback in the neoliberal era that sought to take health down to the level of the individual rather than the collective level at which public health operates. And we see the same debate playing out in Astana now around this debate between vertical and horizontal. So I, I think it's more than simply selling a positive message about impact. It's about selling um, an ideological conflict and recognizing that there are um, enemies in this debate. Enemies is probably a strong word. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, that's, that's well said in the very back. Yeah, actually, I just wanted to follow up on that, and then I have a question. Uh, 1978, there was, a, there was in the middle of the Cold War. That was the height of the human rights era, and there was a polarity between the Soviets wanting, you know, socially, socioeconomic equality, and on the other hand, there was human rights from coming from Jimmy Carter, right? And, uh, and that aspect of it, and that, and that, you know, then the Soviet Union collapsed, and then it started having serious health problems. But 1978 was also the year, and this is the question, uh, 1978 was on the eve of the end of smallpox, and there was a tremendous optimism concerning infectious diseases, right? That they would be wiped out. Uh, and then the AIDS epidemic, you know, came to light in 1981, even though it started much earlier. Um, when they talk about, you know, transnational interference in terms of, you know, human rights. Epidemics, if you look at, let's say, the, you know, the mining industry in South Africa and the, and the synthesis of silicosis, AIDS, and tuberculosis, you know, and, the, and the, the migrants come from all over southern Africa to work there. I mean, how, how, how do they address, the, you know, the communicable diseases if there's such, you know, emphasis on national sovereignty? So, I think that's a very important question because uh, right now I think the world is beginning to think about diseases that we probably don't know about yet. Um, the Ebola outbreak just showed us an example of what could happen when we, the world is not prepared to handle outbreaks. And infectious diseases like HIV AIDS, even though they have shown, the world has shown progress, what we're seeing now is that um, funding for HIV AIDS and some other infectious diseases have plateaued. And if they start to go down, by the very nature of the disease itself, they are infectious, they will begin to climb back up if care is not taken. So it's important that we, we, we address that. And I, I, don't, I don't know that we have a way to do that because every country will have to deal with the issue um, that affects its, 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 its population itself. But at the same time, we're also looking at investing more in global public goods. And we have a stream of research, I think Gavin, Gavin leads that, that looks at how the world can invest more in global public goods. And by global public goods for health, we talk about things that uh, the benefits accrue to more than one country, most likely the whole world, but there is no incentive for each country to invest in that. So how do we finance that? Um, the World Bank uh, um, just set aside some money to finance some of this outbreak preparedness through the global financing facility, and things like that should, I, I would imagine, um, become more commonplace as we think about some of these regional issues. For example, malaria transborder, um, transmission of malaria is still a big problem. So you could eliminate malaria in your country, but if you've not dealt with the transborder um, questions that surround transmission of malaria, it's only a matter of time before it happens. Nigeria, uh, the world eliminated um, polio 
from many countries, but because it was still in Nigeria and Pakistan at some point, and people traveled for Hajj um, several years ago, they exported it back to the world. And it's only now that we're beginning to push it back, and um, hopefully it will be eradicated. So those are valid problems, and I think that we should also consider that while we're thinking about uh, primary health care. I'll turn over to... So we're at time, 15 second, last okay. thing you'd like to say, each of you. I, I would just say, and this speaks to the Alma Ata experience that you mentioned, that the United States under Jimmy Carter was pushing for human rights. The Soviet Union was pushing for human rights. The Global South came together in a non-aligned movement to push for human rights. And in 1980, Ronald Reagan was elected in the United States, Margaret Thatcher in the United Kingdom, oh. and this... <laughs> <laughs> Gavin was desperately affected in his uh, playground days um, <laughs> by this experience, and all of this came crumbling down. And so I, I would just begin, uh, I would end, uh, by saying that, that elections matter, that um, these are norms that are being driven by governments, and these governments are being driven by elections. And so I would, I would as you approach the polls this November, um, keep in mind that primary health care, human rights, and the things we care about in global health are most certainly on the ballot. Any last statement? I'd just like to add that the devil is usually in the details, and after we pass declarations, what happens afterwards is equally, if not more important, than what we did when we declared. So um, afterwards, uh, whatever comes out of this declaration, I think we should plan to implement like crazy and make things happen. <laughs> All right, thank you both, appreciate it.